As the world descends on Egypt for this year's COP27 climate change conference, Canada's parliamentary budget watchdog released a new report detailing climate change's long-term impacts on the Canadian economy. The report found that Canada's real GDP fell by 0.8% in 2021 due to rising temperatures and precipitation since the early 1980s. 0.8% amounts to about $20 billion out of the Canadian economy. By the end of the century, well, the PBO projects an additional reduction of 5.8%. As Canada tightens its purse strings to head off a looming recession, can the government afford to stay the course on its climate policies? Let's bring in the press gallery to weigh in. We have Joyce Napier. She is Napier. She is Nash, CTV National News, our Ottawa Bureau Chief, Bob Fife from the Globe and Mail, also the Bureau Chief here in Ottawa. And our special guest is Parliamentary Budget Officer, Yves Giroux. Thank you all for being here. I guess the first question to you, Mr. Giroux, I mean, what are the real impacts of this through the more extreme weather events that we're seeing now? Um, and, you know, this measure of it, where are the sectors that are more acutely impacted by them? Well, the impacts will be felt, are starting to be felt across the economy, but the sectors that will be most affected are those that are more exposed to weather events. Unsurprisingly, one can think about the agricultural sector, which could benefit from a longer growing season, but also energy use, generally speaking. We may need more energy use in the summer, lower energy intensity during the winter if temperatures are higher, but also uh, climate dependent activities such as tourism and uh, ski resort, for example, but also um, buildings may need to be, um, which are exposed to elements mm -hmm. will be suffering. So, uh, and, and also uh, productivity uh, could be impacted, especially during summer months by higher temperatures. So this is, these are, are all the elements that we have taken into account in our reports to get to uh, a negative impact of 5.8% of GDP by the end of the century. Significant. And Joyce, we just had the full economic statement. They just earmarked about a billion dollars for Hurricane Fiona relief. Should we expect this to become a trend that now we're gonna start to see this in, in budgets on a yearly basis? Oh yes, I think we will see it in federal budgets, but people will see it in their own budgets as well. Uh, so we're thinking of droughts, we're thinking of floods mm -hmm. and, 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 and huge fires. Um, and insurance companies are not, uh, are not stepping up. So governments will have to step up. If you are in a flood, uh, in a floodplain, if your house is built there, because until recently, you didn't know that. Uh, this information was not released to people. So it is going to become more and more costly. And as it becomes more costly, um, the political debate will become, you know, sort of more bitter. You've got on one, on the one hand, the, the conservatives uh, who are against, for instance, the yeah. carbon tax to change people's habits, you have the liberals, you know, sort of trying to impose that as the cost of living increases. So climate is becoming a political football. Yeah, Bob, pick up on that a little bit because you have the conservatives who keep sort of banging that drum of saying that the carbon tax has to be uh, at least given a, a bit of a holiday for Canadians because of the cost of living. living. But now with these uh, numbers that we're seeing, it's coming at a real economic cost to the country. So how, what's the political balance here? Well, I mean, the conservatives have been under, from Stephen Harper on, have been against any kind of serious climate change policies. They put forward issues dealing with regulations, which were somewhat, somewhat successful, but they never really uh, seriously addressed the issue of how we can deal with cl uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. The Liberals have, although they certainly, their rhetoric is far better than their accomplishments, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. But I mean, look, the issue of flooding and drought and all of these things are going to only increase. You know, but the problem we have is you, 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 haven't, you can't get countries like China and India right to seriously deal with climate change. They are the ones for principally responsible. China's 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. They're burn, they're, I think they're, they're uh, burning so much coal now. And we've got to, the world's got to get together as they did in, in, in Paris to, to figure out ways to get green technology and, and frankly, to use more natural gas rather right. than burning coal. So, uh, yeah, I, I was going to say, Mr. Giroux, how key is that? And also to unlocking some of the potential that we're seeing within Canada here to go in that direction. 
Well, it will clearly be key because in our report, we have made the assumption that all the countries that have made pledges, for example, to reach net zero by 2050 or somewhere in the middle of the century, they will deliver on that on time and in full. So, and that's with all these, uh, these assumptions that we get to a negative impact of 5.8% of GDP. So if countries don't deliver on their pledges, then the impact of climate change will be even more expensive on the Canadian economy, but also on other economies across the world. Well, so it is. They're not going to be able to deliver on the pledges because of what's happening in Ukraine and yeah. Russia. That's, that's one very, very important point. Yeah. And, 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 but at the same time, while that pressure is happening, Bob, you have COP27 going on. The prime minister is not going. You see he's sending Stephen Gilboa. Is that an indication of where Canada is with its commitments and what it's able to bring to the table that the prime minister is not going? Well, I mean, has Canada even met any of its commitments? No. Um, and any of its targets, right? And it's, no it's again. <laughs> all, it's a really hard thing to do um, to meet those targets and plus to get people on board because they're thinking, as, as Bob was saying, well, we're not really responsible for this. So why do we have to pay the price? Right. So it's hard to get people on board. It's hard to get companies on board. And, you know, ac across the country, we disagree. Uh, obviously, the West disagrees with Ottawa's policies on it. So, you know, putting people, getting people together in one country, just one country, to agree on a policy is hard enough. Imagine the rest of the world. So and look at the, and the United States. I mean, they're going, look, Republicans want to get back control right. of the House, maybe of the Senate. They're going to gut anything that do, do yeah. with, with climate change. They don't care. So what does that mean for COP27 then, Bob? I mean, does it have any hope in, in actually, you know, and this is maybe too, yeah. too big before, of a question. Before Ukraine, possibly, there would have been more. Right. Uh, but now we've got, you know... Russia's cut off energy to Europe. Yeah. Europe's are now burning coal. Um, you know, China doesn't seem to care anymore. Should even though their people are, if you, if you go to China, I mean, no. you can't breathe. Right. Uh, but, but for some reason, they're still not doing very much about it. So it makes, I mean, I feel fear for our children, frankly, because uh, the climate is, our climate is burning up. And there isn't a willingness, so you, you can't, deal with climate change unless you have the United States, India, China, and some of the um, other a Asian countries, which are really burning a lot of coal, to get together and get serious about this. So, Mr. Giroux, is the key then to put an economic price on it so that everybody understands it? Well, that's a, that's a good question. And that's in part why we are releasing this report today, to put that information out there so that parliamentarians and Canadians have at least an idea of the order of magnitude of the cost, potential costs of climate change. And as I said, our assumptions are that all the pledges are met in full and on time. And if they are not delivered on, then the cost will be even higher. So that's why we are putting that such numbers in a report like that with all its assumptions so that Canadians can have that debate. How much do you hope it breaks through the noise? I know every one of your reports you hope gets traction, but I mean this one especially because, uh, you know, to, to Bob's point, we worry about our children and grandchildren here. Well, I'm hopeful that people will get, will focus on that because in briefings today, this is one of the reports that has gathered the most attention on its first day of release. So I am hopeful that people are turning their attention to climate change, to its impacts, to the consequences and to the costs, as well as potentially the costs of inaction. Yeah, and as we continue to wait now for health ministers in BC, we're gonna continue the conversation a little bit here. Um, Joyce, but is that sort of the key now to continue putting it in the window, that this is going to cost you financially if you do not take care of the environment? Absolutely, and, and I do believe that people were interested in it, but it's hard to have people wrap their brain around the fact that what you pay today is nothing compared to what it will cost tomorrow. And that is a concept that people just don't grasp, right? It's, it's not costing me anything today. Why do I have to put out money? Why does it have to cost right. me? Why do I have to pay a carbon tax? Why, why, why today? But the reason why we're doing that today, or we should be doing that today, is because the cost tomorrow will be immense. Uh, but, it, but how can you sell that as a politician or as political parties? It's something that's very difficult to sell to people say, okay, we've got to make sacrifices right. today because this is what could happen tomorrow. 
and this is how much it will happen to cost tomorrow as opposed to the, the, what it's costing us today. Better if we do it today, it will be cheaper than if we wait another 10 years or five years or whatever. But, but it's, it's a hard concept for politicians to, to, to sell to, to, uh, to uh, people and to taxpayers. Yeah, we're continuing to watch for this press conference to start. So, Bob, I'm just going to ask you very quickly here in, term of that, in terms of that, is it that issue now that there's too much on the plate right now? Ukraine, cost of living, inflation, everything. So is this the type of thing right now where we go, wow? Well, I mean, there is, we, there is some reason to be somewhat optimistic. I mean, we, because of Ukraine, you've seen the Europeans saying, look, we have got to move much quicker in terms of green technology. You saw the president of the Sorry, United Bob, States gotta, do that I, too. I apologize. I got to cut yeah, you off. Yeah. We're going right to that press conference now. Adrian Dix, the BC.